Greetings, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Andreas Benokratis, and I'm a product manager for the Ansible Network Automation product, and I'll be your MC today. Today's Ansible Automation webinar is being hosted by Timothy Abnell and is entitled Ansible Best Practices, Roles, and Modules. Tim is a senior principal product manager with Red Hat Ansible, and he'll go through the fascinating world of developing Ansible roles and modules. Now, before I begin, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. All participants will be on mute for the duration of the webinar. So if you have any questions during the presentation, we ask that you use the questions feature in the webinar app, and you can ask your question there. Uh, we'll try and get, I'll try and um, answer some questions throughout, uh, but we're gonna leave most of them till the end um, so that Tim can present since he's the only presenter here. So um, also, if there is time at the end of, you know, if there's time at the end of the webinar, we will address as many questions as possible. Last and not least, this webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on the training and webinar section of ansible.com, uh, hopefully by next week. So without further ado, let's kick things off. Hand it over to you, Tim. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're coming from. Uh, as as Andreas said, uh, I'm Tim Atmo. I'm a product manager uh, with the Ansible team, and I'm going to be talking about best practices, for, particularly around the area of roles and modules. Uh, this is a talk my, uh, on best practices that we've done that uh, myself and my colleagues have given on the essentials. This here is a continuation of sorts to that, getting a bit deeper and drilling down into what is the, 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 the purpose and proper usage and good design of roles and modules. Uh, when we reach the module section, I won't be going into really Python coding because that's, I think, a very well-documented thing of how to write good Python code. Uh, I'm going to be focusing more on, on the, the, the proper design and implementation of modules when we get to that section there. All right, so um, moving right along here. There we go. Uh, so as I said, I've been giving this talk for quite some time uh, on, on uh, uh, best practices myself and my colleagues. Uh, and I always like to start with the philosophy that is behind uh, Ansible and its design. Um, this is something that permeates throughout the entire design of the, of the product. And I think it's really uh, important to keep in mind because a lot of best practices come back to this uh, way of thinking and this philosophy. So, um, you know, Ansible is a like Swiss army knife of DevOps is capable of handling uh, many different powerful automation tasks and workflows and has the, the flexibility to adapt to these different environments. And not all of these approaches, while, while it's very flexible, not all of these approaches are created equal. So the idea here is to uh, help you not undermine the simplicity and power of Ansible and to provide you the experience that we have had working with customers, working with users over the years and helping you get the most out of Ansible. So one of the first uh, philosophies and one that we talk about a lot is the complexity kills productivity. One message we talk about a lot is in, with Ansible is about simplicity, and that's not just a marketing slogan. We really mean it, we believe it, we strive for it uh, all the time in what we're doing at Ansible in, in the design of the software and, and really in everything that we do. And we really recommend that you uh, apply that same philosophy in what you're automating and how you're using Ansible. Another is to optimize for readability. If you do your Ansible automation properly, it can act as the documentation of your workflow. And we'll see with the way that you implement roles and the way that you utilize modules, that can contribute to the readability of your automation. And the third is to think declaratively. Uh, Ansible is a desired state engine by design. If you're trying to write code in your plays and roles, you're setting yourself up for failure. That is what modules are for. Uh, if you want to code, if you need to do sophisticated logic, that's what modules are for. And we'll go into that a little bit more in a moment here. So the key thing to remember is that, that YAML is a, 
is really not made for uh, programming. And uh, if you're doing those sorts of things, you, you're probably doing something wrong, need to re-examine how you're implementing your automation. And we'll cover that in the slides that are coming up soon. So let's start with, so we have roles and modules are, are very common ways of uh, extending what you can do with Ansible and enhancing uh, your automation. Picking the right one for the job is crucial to your success here. So, all right. So roles to 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 differentiate how what the what the two are for and what's the right tool for the right job. Roles are self-contained portable units of Ansible automation. They're expressed in YAML and are bundled with associated assets, things like templates and files and um, uh, metadata variables, things like that. And what roles do is that, that they decouple uh, the assumptions that are made in plays, like what hosts am I targeting or what type of, of um, rights uh, escalation mechanism am I using, things of that nature. It's Roles are decoupling that so that you can create these reusable bundles of automation that can be shared and utilized in different ways more easily. Modules, on the other hand, are small programs that perform actions typically on a remote host or on, the be or on their behalf and are expressed as code. The majority of modules in Ansible are written in Python. Our Windows implementations are written in PowerShell. There are ways of writing custom code using other languages. Uh, a module is called directly by a task, and that modules are what are doing all the heavy lifting in Ansible. When someone says to me, how, how does Ansible, how is it both simple and powerful at the same time? And the key is the module system. The, we present a simple uh, readable interface to these modules, and then the modules do all the heavy lifting where all the uh, uh, complexity and the full power of a programming language is abstracted away from the majority of users. In fact, it's from all the users, you only really see and have to deal with Python code if you're a developer trying to extend Ansible itself. So continuing on, um, you know, the reasons that you would uh, um, want to use a role is that, that they promote reuse and collaboration of common automation and workflow, different uh, common configurations, and that roles can provide full life cycles, uh, management, like management of a service or microservice or container. Roles can also act as your de facto enforcement of standards, policies, and workflows. Uh, if you develop a role for a common task or for a common workflow and say across your organization, this is the way we set up our um, Redis caching. This is the way we set up Varnish. This is the way we set up Postgres. Everyone use the same role. You create a de facto standard for the way that you deploy this software uh, infrastructure or, or even um, network infrastructure by sharing and reusing that role. Now, a module has a different purpose in that it is uh, used for more sophisticated interactions and logics. Uh, it's usually a unit of work that's uh, tied to a command line or, or APIs, uh, and like I said, brings the, utilizes the full power of a programming language to doing this type of sophisticated logic, conditionals, you know, uh, data manipulation, things of, of that nature. As I said already, that modules are what's doing the heavy lifting. It's abstracting the complexity away from the end user and makes it uh, much easier to do powerful things by doing uh, by through that abstraction layer. So one way that I uh, suggest that people think about a, an analogy of sorts of telling the difference between a, a role and a module is that uh, a module is really like the uh, tools in your toolbox. It's, it's your hammers, your screwdrivers, your saws, things like that, where roles are the instruction manuals of what it is or the, or the blueprints of what it is you're trying to build. 
whether it's a, a table or a house, you're using all these tools, assembling them, using them in different orders, applying them differently in order to build something. And that something is in Ansible speak is what a role helps you do. So I think this is a pretty good analogy for keeping it uh, uh, in your head. What is the right uh, tool, so to speak, to use here, whether you use a module or need a bunch of modules uh, or should use a role here. All right, so hopefully that clarifies uh, the purpose of modules and roles in Ansible and when you should use each of these. I'm going to move on now to talking some about uh, good role design and best practices of, uh, in, in developing your roles. The, the truth of the matter is, is that a lot of the same best practices that we've talked about in the essentials still, uh, still apply to, um, to role design. Use native YAML syntax, uh, version control your, your Ansible content or your roles. Uh, use the command modules sparingly. Seek out a module first. Put uh, uh, meaningful names on your plays, your blocks, your tasks and uh, clean up your debugging message. These are all things that we covered in the best practices essentials uh, talk that, that we've given in the past. They all apply to roles here the same way. There's no real difference there. Uh, so moving on beyond that, one of the, the key things we recommend doing with your role design is to keep the purpose and the function of a role self-contained and focused. Uh, applying some of the same type of, of, of design principles that go into Linux itself. Do one thing well. So when I'm talking to people about how do you decide uh, uh, what goes into a role is to, I always suggest to think about what is the full life cycle of what it is you're trying to manage, of, of whether it's a service or a microservice or a container. You don't want to fall into the trap of trying to encapsulate an entire stack or an entire environment in one single role. That, that's an anti-pattern that you, you definitely want to avoid, and I'll, I'll talk about that in an example um, shortly. Another thing you want to do is really keep your provisioning separate from your configuration and your app deployment. You want the flexibility to move to different environments, different cloud providers, and to be able to replicate what you're doing there uh, more easily. And if you combine, let's say, your AWS provisioning code with uh, you know, how you set up your Postgres database into one role, you lose that flexibility. Where if you separate those two out and you roll out Postgres or, or um, you know, Redis out to one of these cloud providers and you have to run it on VMware or move it on to bare metal, you can replicate that and you can still share that because you uh, just run the app deployment and configuration role and it is with a different provisioning role. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more. A couple of gotchas that uh, you can fall into with role design that we recommend you stay away from is to uh, not treat roles as if they're classes or objects or libraries. Those things are programming constructs. Uh, I've, I've been brought into some uh, customers that were, were having problems and I came to find that they were treating them that way and it, and it really didn't turn out very well. And there's, there's a whole deep technical conversation for why that is. The, 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 the biggest being that we don't have scoping in roles and that Ansible has a flat namespace by design. That's one of the... Um, um, uh, leading reasons. You don't get that encapsulation that you would in a class or an object, things of that nature. So don't act like a Java programmer. Uh, that's not what roles are for. Uh, another thing to keep in mind where I've uh, seen some uh, users get themselves into trouble, uh, you should really keep roles loosely coupled uh, and limit hard dependencies on other roles and external variables. Where, where the trouble begins is when, when you create these really intricate dependencies between roles and variables that becomes very difficult to manage, develop, debug, uh, and maintain over time. So uh, we, we recommend uh, keeping things uh, uh, as coarse-grained as possible when it comes to your role design. All right, so here's an example to try to get across some of the, the, the principles I just talked about here. These are, these are made up examples that, uh, that just to illustrate the point. 
on the left here, we have what is a, a, a monolith, sort of a black box roll. It looks really appealing. I only have to drop one roll in my playbook and voila, I have the entire um, stack and environment coming up. But if I had taken this example a little bit further, I can guarantee you that, first of all, that role is incredibly complex, is going to be full of lots of conditionals, uh, uh, compound conditionals, um, filters, a uh, lot, lot, of, lot of logic in it in order to build the entire stack because your stack is most likely going to require many different hosts that are all filling different roles and you're going to have to manage in your role what parts go onto which host in the role itself rather than letting Ansible do the work. The other part is that if I need to reuse a part of what is in uh, this black box role, uh, it's now stuck in there and I have to cut and paste uh, that logic if I want to reuse it again or recreate that logic elsewhere where I need it. So what we recommend is what you're seeing under exhibit B on the right, which is where we've, uh, for, we, we, we've created roles that are, are slightly more fine grained that are focused around a, a service or a microservice. And what that lets us do is have the flexibility to piece these together in a way that makes sense that we can, uh, we can reuse them for other uses, we can reapply them, and we let Ansible do the work of targeting the specific hosts where, these, uh, where this app deployment, where this configuration, or where this provisioning needs to happen, uh, rather than try to build that logic into our own role. So we get greater flexibility and we let Ansible do the work for us. So on the right here, uh, just to go over quickly, we see that we're provisioning something to Azure, then we're rolling out uh, system security settings across all the hosts in our inventory, and then we're going out to the, 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 the hosts in our inventory that are web servers and applying a number of different Python libraries, Nginx, um, and let's say our web application here, which is Raccoon app, and then going out to our database servers and setting up Postgres and setting up Postgres replication between those servers, rather than like I said, going across all of them and trying to add the conditional logic to our role in order to um, in order to handle uh, uh, targeting the right host for the, the 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 right configuration, the right app deployment. All right, moving along. Uh, maximize your roles designed for portability and reuse. I've already been talking about that. That's a key thing to uh, a number of these best practices is, is, is in the flexibility and the ability to uh, reapply the, the, the same automation to other usages. So one of, the, one of the things that we recommend is to use the Ansible Galaxy command line tool to install your roles. Uh, use a roles file here, it's requirements.yamls, what the, 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 the typical uh, convention is. Uh, it works as like a manifest to um, um, list out which roles you're going to pull in from different shared sources. And uh, when you are using a shared role, always declare a specific version, such as a tag or a commit. What one, uh, uh, and this is one that uh, I've suffered from, is that if you're always, if, you're, if you don't declare a version, you're always pulling the latest from master. And if something changed in the master, it could break your automation unexpectedly and at the worst time, like on a Friday afternoon, which is what happened to me once right before a class. I did an up, update of my roles, and uh, it just so happened the uh, role developer I, who I was pulling from did a heavy refactor of their role, and it broke all my stuff. And it was because I wasn't pulling from a specific version, and it unexpectedly introduced all these bugs into what I was doing. You don't want to get caught like that, so always, um, you know, pin uh, the role that you're using to a specific version to avoid that type of instability, so that you're ready for, uh, or or can better control when you're going to introduce changes to your workflow. All right, another thing, uh, 
uh, best practice with roles is that roles should run with as few, if any, parameters as possible. Should always practice uh, convention over configuration. This is something that I know was popularized by uh, Ruby on Rails. I don't know if they really invented it, but it's a really good uh, idea of when you're designing your roles is to always provide same defaults that the role, uh, well, we'll show this, I'll show this in a minute in an example that follows this slide. Uh, but use variable parameter. You should only be using variable parameters to modify the default behavior of the role. This just makes it easier to develop, test, and use uh, the role more uh, quickly and securely. Uh, and then one other, and this is a, a small pet peeve of mine, is that a role should always be more than just a single task file. I've come across many instances where someone created a role and it just has a single task file. If that's all you really need, there is uh, include, you can include tasks from a, a separate file. You don't need to go through building an entire role. But I would also argue that you should also have at a minimum a task file and a defaults variables file in anything that you do in order for the, the things I just talked about to provide uh, a, a default behavior, but then also make it easier for others to modify that default behavior um, in their usage of your role. So here's an example of what I mean um, that I put together. On the left here, we have a uh, role that's being used twice that does not use defaults, and it passes through. It's a, it's a, it's a simple Apache role for, for deploying Apache, and we have to pass uh, four variables into the role in order for it to operate. And this works. Uh, you know, I don't want to say that this doesn't work, but if you look at the parameters, you'll notice, for example, that it's you're repeating the same parameters. We, we all know that uh, port 80 is the default for Apache, that, that web servers always start on 80 by default. And uh, we're also using the same doc root that everyone uses and the same user and group that is the default inside of Apache. We also look, we'll see that we're repeating the, the user and group in the next one. So we're, 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 that's making this more verbose. So now on the right, we have what is a role that is using a default, uh, has default variables. If you look at the bottom half there, you see what's in the default uh, variables file where we're setting 80, where we're setting the doc root to where Apache always puts stuff in the user and the group. So on the top now, when we use Apache simple in our playbook, we just have to call that role. And everything works, Just it just works. It does what we expect it to do. It does the default behavior here. And the end user just had to add that role. Now, if the end user has to do something a little bit different, like um, use a different doc root or start Apache on a different uh, port, they have the ability to modify that default behavior by just adding the two variables to do an override of those. And in this case here, they didn't have to they uh, specify the user in the group. They were able to take advantage of the defaults there. They just had to change and modify the behaviors that they needed changed. So hopefully this example gets across what we mean by uh, uh, convention over configuration and, and providing same defaults. All right, more on, on role usability. Uh, use variables in your roles appropriately. Oh, we just talked about defaults, uh, but it, there's also the ability inside of roles to set variables. And this is a question I get asked a lot when I'm teaching Ansible, uh, is what's the difference between defaults and variables? And it really, it's the variable precedence of how Ansible determines uh, when it has uh, one variable being set from multiple sources, which one do I use? Defaults are very easy to override and are most commonly used to modify behavior like we talked about. And variables are more common in, inside of a role are used by the role and are more likely not to be changed because they're much higher in the variable precedence chain and are harder to override, um, whether through inventory or facts. It, it, so we tend to use 
defaults for things like maybe ports or default users and variables or things like maybe a list of packages that my web application needs to install or a lookup table of machine images by region uh, in your cloud provider. Hopefully that gets across which one you decide to put it in. Um, so this is an example of what I just said. Uh, on the left, we have what we just saw earlier in a previous example that here's the default variables for an Apache server that we know. So these are easily overridden at any point in our um, different variable sources coming in. But then uh, on, the, on the right, we have an example of uh, like internal data that the role might use, which is which Apache packages are we using? And we even have it broken down into the OS family of Red Hat and Debian, where the package names are different depending um, um, what package manager you're using and what OS you're on. So this, this is a more concrete example of what I said in the previous slide. Uh, so another thing you want to do with your roles is automate the testing of your roles. Uh, at the, the last Ansible Fest, we announced that we have uh, adopted a community project called Molecule. Molecule is a testing framework designed to aid in the development of testing Ansible roles. Uh, it was initially, like I said, developed by the community guy named John Dewey, who's at Cisco, uh, had, had developed it. We've adopted and are now actively developing it and uh, uh, adding, beginning to add more features to and expand the capabilities of what Molecule can do. We really recommend you start getting into the practice of writing tests to uh, um, check that your roles will work as you expect and that you can more easily maintain them as you do changes over time that, that you don't experience breaks. And if you do, that they're flagged before they go into. Uh, production or you, you, you take them any further than your, um, your own development. So definitely check out uh, Molecule. You can see it's now under the, uh, the Ansible uh, account on GitHub. Uh, and there are uh, some IRC, there's now regular IRC meetings around Molecule where they're uh, planning out the features and, and uh, advancing that tool. Another, another thing to consider that's under the uh, uh, testing of roles, Ansible Lint, it's a command line static analysis tool that checks playbooks and roles, identifies behavior that could be improved. We're trying to build a lot of these best practices into rules that go into Lint to try to flag these sorts of uh, uh, things that could be done better through static analysis. Uh, this is also comes from the community, a gent named Will Thames had developed and maintained this. We've recently, we, we announced at uh, Ansible Fest that we were adopting that project. It's now also under the Ansible account. Um, really check out that tool. We, we've already integrated into uh, Galaxy that when you import roles into Galaxy, it runs it through Ansible Lint and flags some of these uh, behaviors. So definitely check these tools out and make them part of your development workflow. So, if you still find that you're using command modules a lot, this is something that we talk about in the essentials that you should always try to use modules first, or you find yourself starting to kind of program inside of your roles. This example I have on the screen shows a lot of that type of programming pattern where you're using something like shell or command, and then you're registering something to a variable to use that variable in the next task to do a conditional to run another command and then register that. That's, a, that's the beginnings of, a, of programming in your playbook. And you, you really want to try to avoid that as much as possible. Sometimes it's a, a necessary evil. But if you do find yourself doing that, you should really consider developing your own module. Uh, this here is just you know, a, a made up example of a, a command line tool called Certify that maybe it's a, a tool that you've built in-house for yourself and you're trying to use it to automate, consider writing a module. It makes it much more readable. Uh, it make, uh, makes it much easier to uh, utilize and it requires a lot less knowledge of your end users to, um, to implement in their automation. So hopefully you can see that between the two examples I just showed how that makes it uh, much more simple but still provides the same automation power um, um, in, in your automation to 
your end users. So with that, I'm gonna move on to talking about modules. And like I said, uh, we're not gonna get too much into code here. I do have some examples I, I might pull up to show very uh, very quickly of, of, of code that you can go over yourself. There's, there's more than enough information out there on writing good Python code. I'm gonna focus on the design of modules, the usage of, of modules, um, best practices. So the first thing to keep in mind about modules is that modules are user-centric. Uh, there's, there's a lot to, to cover here, but, but to expand on that, what we mean by user-centric, modules are how Ansible balances simple and powerful. I've been saying that, that's a key thing, a key takeaway from this presentation that you need to keep in mind when you're thinking about best practices and, and, and extending Ansible. Uh, modules implement common automation tasks for a user. Remember, they're the tools in your toolbox, the hammers, the screwdrivers, the saws, things of that nature. Uh, and the idea of a module is to make a task easier and make complicated tasks possible. Um, that's a sort of riffing off of uh, uh, Perl there. Uh, and the, the, the one other thing is that they abstract the user from having to know all the details to get something done. They need to automate something. They don't need to be an expert in the APIs and all the different switches and conditions. You want to try to uh, do that work for them in the module. So some of the traps or some of the, on the flip side of that, uh, you want to consider about modules is that modules should not be one-to-one -one mappings of an API or a command line tool. Um, this is part of the reason why we're not fans of auto-generating modules. We've seen some vendors try to do that. And I actually have a, an example of that uh, I hope to show here. Uh, the, the other thing to consider is that often to perform a task, an end user will, it, it, in, in terms of code, you'll be making multiple API calls. So if you're doing a one-to-one -one mapping of an API, you're, you're forcing the end user to understand the API. You're, you're forcing them to do, uh, take, uh, create multiple tasks, actual tasks inside of Ansible in order to really do uh, one logical task of one thing that they want to do. And you want to try to avoid that because it makes read, it makes it harder to develop, harder to debug, it's harder to read when you're going through that. And the other thing, which is the uh, opposite of a one-to-one -one mapping of an API, is you also want to avoid writing a module that is monolithic and does everything in, you know, a, a module that just covers uh, all the functionality of a given system in that one because it leads to, uh, it, it, it's hard to understand how to properly use the module. It's hard to validate the user input. It's, it just makes it a lot more complicated for the end user to uh, use it effectively versus having a module that is more targeted around a certain user-centric task. Like I said, hopefully, I'm gonna bring up some examples here in a little bit that bring across uh, more of these principles and uh, we'll talk about them, we'll come back to them then. All right, so another thing to keep in mind with module design is to keep uh, that the, the, the powerful part of modules starts with the implementation. And the things you wanna keep in mind when you're developing a module is that there are no side effects to what your module will do on multiple runs. You need to build in the logic to make them uh, um, understand state and act accordingly versus uh, creating some sort of side effect that may cause a break or, or some undesirable effect uh, after multiple runs. Always err on the side of safety. Uh, there are numerous uh, utility functions inside of Ansible. I say I'm not going to be able to, to dive into that code itself, but uh, in, in both Python and Ansible itself, there are functions that help you do things like um, you know, atomic moves and, you know, set up temporary files to do your work until you've successfully completed and then swap the files, things, things of that nature. You also, in your modules, want to fail fast. You want to immediately detect and report failure conditions as quickly as possible with as little effort uh, being done on the remotes. And also, uh, you know, before you make any type of changes that will leave your systems in a um, some type of 
middle state or undesirable state that you don't want. So always work on determining if you have a problem in the beginning of your module and fail uh, as quickly as you can if there is an issue. Other smaller things that we really recommend is supporting check mode in your modules and to also use minimal use of dependencies. A lot of Ansible modules depend on um, external Python libraries for, uh, uh, for their usage. A, a good example is AWS uses the Bodo and Bodo 3 libraries. Uh, try to keep those to a minimum. I know you can't uh, eliminate them because we don't, uh, but you also don't want to have develop modules that take five, six, seven uh, dependencies from PIP or whatever you're using. Uh, to, to uh, in order for those modules to work properly. Right. Another thing to keep in mind uh, when you're developing modules is that modules should provide a predictable user interface. Uh, you know, I talked about it from the in the very beginning. Think about desired state. Think declaratively. You want your you want to avoid, and and this second point ties to that first one is you want to avoid things like parameters that are like action or command parameters in your module design. If you're if you find yourself creating that type of an interface or or putting that type of option in your interface, is a good chance you're probably not thinking and designing uh, for that type of declarative desi uh, desired state that Ansible uh, implements throughout its core modules. Uh, you want to keep uh, parameters focused and narrowly defined. Uh, one, one common mistake I see made in module design is that someone will put one parameter in that takes a very complex data structure. Um, and the problem there is that it makes it harder on the end user to get that right. It also makes it hard, it, it, you, you're, you're eliminating Ansible from doing its validation easily for you. There are built-in functions, uh, an R, R spec validator inside the modules that as a module developer you can use, but when it comes to a complex data structure like this, you're on your own and now have to uh, validate that yourself in your own Python code. So we recommend you try to uh, refrain from that sort of thing. It's, it's sometimes not avoidable, but if you can do it, do it, you'll be much better off. Uh, a, a finer point, but I still think an important one is that parameter names should be in lowercase and use underscores for spacing. So here we have an update underscore cache all in lowercase. That's the convention that we use throughout Ansible. What you want to avoid doing is things like title case or camel case that are, are common in other programming languages like we have um, which I have here in the second and third lines um, of that example at the end. All right, uh, moving right along here. Um, so modules should provide, this is, this, is, this is working off the theme of predictable user interface. Another thing you wanna consider is normalizing common parameter names uh, that are used in other modules. And this is a, 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 a list of very common ones that you will find throughout Ansible. Uh, that I recommend that if you can use these for something, use them rather than make up one of your own. Uh, name and state are probably the most common. Destination and source or dest and SRC. Uh, path username, password. These are all the, the common ones. This is not an exhaustive list, but it's the ones that you will see most commonly. Um, a finer point not listed here is sometimes you're coming from a system that maybe has a very specific or a different vocabulary. There are, uh, our modules give you the ability to create aliases to parameters. So one recommend, recommendation we make is to use those aliases. For example, something in containers might use an ID, not a name. Well, what you can do is um, you can create an ID parameter and alias it to name. So for people that are coming from the Ansible world that are used to identifying things by the name parameter, they can use that. And the people that are coming from your container system that is using uh, ID can use that parameter and they function the same and to your code internally, it all looks the same. You don't have to work that out. All right. So um, I brought up some examples here and I'm gonna uh, just switch over to my browser here one second. Let's see 
here. All right. Hopefully everyone sees. Oh. All right. So I'm going to show you some modules really quickly as an example. Uh, this is one that was built uh, for Kubernetes that was brought into us. It was a, it was a fine piece of work. Uh, but the biggest problem here that we found is that, well, first of all, the, the module itself was very, the underlying code was very complicated. But the other is that this one module, this is an example of a monolith that does, tries to do everything you would need to do with a Kubernetes stack. And it was written uh, in the very early days of, of Kubernetes as, as its popularity was beginning to grow. And uh, uh, a lot has changed in Kubernetes since then. So, so the design had its shortcomings. The other is that it required a lot, a lot of knowledge of how Kubernetes works and how the, uh, the Kubernetes API works. So here, um, for example, we had this inline data and you had to know what all these things were. You had to have this uh, expert knowledge of the Kubernetes API. So that, that led to some very complicated return values and things. We found it just to be, we could do better. Uh, so the next attempt that was made was done by someone in our OpenShift team here. And what they do is they used uh, Swagger to run against the Kubernetes API, which is changing rapidly. It also has this uh, uh, custom resources that you can add to the API, which makes the, the working with the API uh, kind of tricky and, and difficult. And I don't blame them for attempting this. Uh, but what they do is they auto-generated the, these Ansible modules based on the API itself. And as you can see here, as I scroll through, I mean, this is a ton of modules. I mean, and they're all, very, very fine grain and really, really require deep expert knowledge. I'm still scrolling here. It, it generated so many for OpenShift and Kubernetes. It just required a lot, a lot of knowledge of Kubernetes and did not make automating Kubernetes clusters uh, easy at all uh, and, and not, not simple. So uh, this is an example why we're not fans of auto-generating modules. Uh, out there, and also why you want to avoid doing uh, these type of one-to-one -one mappings of your API. So another attempt, and the one that we're we're currently working with, a uh, lot of improvements to this. It is similar to the first module I showed in Kubernetes in that it is a single module for working with Kubernetes. Uh, that's something I would love to see us improve upon, but it is the one thing it did a lot better is it cut down the amount of code to about like 500 lines and utilizes libraries that are out there uh, in the wild being used by other systems to work with Kubernetes versus the first example I showed you, which tried to implement it all itself um, um, in one module and created like thousands and thousands of lines of, of code and made it really difficult and very inflexible. Here we now um, benefit from the underlying libraries and all that work being done outside of the Ansible uh, community. So this one is a lot better than the one we recommend you use. The, the interface is, is a lot cleaner. I said the one thing it does that or, or doesn't do is, is it still requires a certain amount of, of expert knowledge of Kubernetes and how Kubernetes works in order to use these modules. What I would love to see, and we have one example of this, is more modules like this one here, Kate Scale. So this one here, the reason I like this one, I wanna show this one for uh, best practices, instead of trying to do everything that you might wanna do in Kate's, here's a module that is focused strictly on doing uh, replica sets and replica controllers inside of Kubernetes. So what happens is that you get a much more, uh, um, let's uh, say focus and easier to understand. And I know there's a lot of parameters here, but the examples show that you don't have to have, you don't have these complex data types that you have to uh, figure out and validate yourself. It's a very specific use for, for a very certain part of Kubernetes. And I, I would, you know, me personally as the best practice evangelist around Ansible is to see more modules like this one 
created for these very specific common resource types inside and, and tasks inside of, of managing a Kubernetes cluster. All right. Let me switch back to the slides now and keep moving here. I wanted to leave at least a few minutes for um, um, for questions. And um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try to get through these very quickly. So uh, another another thing about modules that you want to consider is is providing informative and consistent responses. For whoever, when for whoever's using the module, that when they when they register and capture the return from your module, that they uh, have information that makes it make that helps them understand what may have gone wrong or right or what work was done. So be consistent in what you're returning. Uh, make the response data reusable by a player role. Consider that if they do a register to a variable, um, you know how how usable is this data that you're returning to them? Sending them a single text blob uh, isn't easy for them to use, but if you can cut things down into and create a, uh, a nice structured piece of data with you know, key elements that they may need to pull out already parsed inside of your module and put into the JSON blob that the module sends back, that makes it a lot easier for the user, a lot more cleaner for what they have to do in the playbook. So consider those sorts of things when you're writing your module. Uh, only return relevant output. Uh, one common mistake we've seen is people that ship back entire logs inside of the module response. Uh, you don't want to go overboard in what you're responding. If you do need that, maybe you need to write the log to a temporary spot and send back the location of that so someone could go out and get it if they really need it. Um, make sure you accurately report whether something changed or not. Remember that this is a uh, how Ansible works and it's a desired state system. You want to report if something didn't require any work or if it actually changed because that may affect a handler firing off or it may um, you know, uh, cause a, a notification or a flag to get thrown that something got changed. So really work on uh, determining if you did make a, a change to report that a change happened. And another thing to really consider is if you can um, do something, you know, support the diff mode. If you can compare what the original state was and what the new state is, uh, report that back. We have that built into Ansible, and it's and it really is helpful if your end user can throw on diff mode in their playbook run and get back that type of information from your module. Uh, the other, another thing to consider is to handle your errors gracefully. Uh, apply defensive programming. We've already talked about failing fast. Validate up front. Use the built-in argspec function, which I'll show you in a second uh, when I pop over to some more examples. And try to fail predictively and provide informative error messages. Don't just send back a, uh, a stack trace or, or whatever error message you got back from the library. If you can try to figure some things out and provide a, a human meaningful uh, informative error message, do that in your module. Take the time to do that. It you really will pay off dividends. Uh, and the one thing, and I you know, just kind of said it, what, what one would say I've seen is that someone wraps an entire um, module's logic in a try block and then just echoes back the exception that they got from Python itself. You want to try to avoid that sort of thing. It's just not friendly. It, it, it puts a lot of the uh, onus on the end user uh, to figure out what went wrong. Um, you know, take the time to do something that, that is much more helpful. And another thing to consider with module development is don't reinvent the wheel. We see this in a lot of the, the pull requests that we got, is that we have a whole library of module utils. They're your friends. These are some of the most common ones I have up here on the screen. Um, there's a lot of others in there. There are dozens of them. And these are all utility functions that you can use in your module instead of reinventing them and sticking them in there. Um, I can tell you, uh, our, if our engineers see you re-implementing functions inside of a module that you are trying to submit to us, uh, it'll get sent back. Uh, you'll have to utilize, you know, change your code to utilize the one that's in uh, module utils. Another uh, quick point is that uh, documentation is a requirement your example should include the most common real-world examples. 
You should also have uh, examples in native YAML syntax, uh, just much easier to read and parse what's going on there. You should also document what your module will return to the end user so that if they register the return to a variable, they know what they have to work with in there. And also don't forget to document any dependencies you might have. You know, like I was saying earlier, AWS uses Bodo, Bodo 3. You want to say that, that your module needs that library so that they can bootstrap the system or their controller ahead of time before running your, your module and finding out um, they're missing a dependency. And then the, uh, another thing, uh, you know, test before you commit and push your code. This seems like a, um, you know, a, a, an obvious thing, but we do see a lot of people that will some send in PRs and not use some of the tools that are in the Ansible core, like test module or the Ansible test to check their code. They're, they're letting our CI system do it for them. Uh, we all know with changes that have happened in Travis, that's a, an issue uh, for a lot of people out there. Um, Ansible itself is using Shippable, so we, we've been okay on that. But still, you know, take, take advantage of these tools, test locally. Uh, also, don't forget to test your roles and playbooks. Uh, you know, we have Molecule out there. I've already mentioned that. So take advantage of these tools um, um, before you, you push your code out to the world. So really quickly before I go into any questions, uh, these are some examples. Uh, if you want to examine modules that are done well um, um, and learn from examining the code, these are ones I really recommend. And I'm going to quickly switch to... Uh, let me go to ping just because I don't have a lot of time. Uh, SysControl is a really good one that's more complex, uh, but ping is a great example of um, one that is um, has some code in it that, uh, 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 sorry, system, I'm mean, getting distracted switching my, my browser here. Uh, ping ping's a good example of just the basic structure of, of a role. Uh, sys control gets a lot more sophisticated in what it's doing. So let me just scroll up to the top here. I'm just looking at uh, through GitHub here. Uh, as we see, we have uh, some metadata. Here's the documentation that you see on uh, uh, docs.ansible.com, or if you run a, the Ansible doc uh, command line tool. Here we have some uh, basic examples of how you use ping and then how you can use ping to uh, induce an exception to see what happens in your playbook. And then here we also have the return, what it will come back from this system, um, uh, or I'm sorry, from this module if I register it to a variable. Uh, we see here we're making use of uh, module utils, just the basic one, uh, because that has a class in it for doing an Ansible module. And then we have here the main function of ping. Now, ping's a very simple module, so it's a very, very short piece of code. But we see we're using the Ansible module class, and we're setting up the R expect to say that we expect a uh, data parameter uh, that's going to be a string that uh, defaults to Pong. And we also tell it that we support check mode here. This is all stuff that's in uh, the Ansible developer guide and the documentation. So unfortunately, I can't go over it. But we, we get use of some other, um, other functions here, like exit JSON. There's a number of other uh, functions not uh, pictured here. Said, so take some time to look through some of the other ones like uh, syscontrol here, where we see we're, we have like fail JSON, uh, exit JSON. There's, there's a lot of other, as you see, what you can do with the uh, arg spec up top there. Uh, unfortunately, I'm running out of time that I can't cover that. And I want to take at least a couple more questions. So. Uh, one thing I just want to make you aware of really quickly is that uh, modules and uh, uh, there is something called action plugins. Uh, sometimes modules need a little bit more. Action plugins work as the local controller for how a module is prepared and uh, sent off to the remote. Uh, they're not always, there, there's a default one that you may not, that you could just use the default action plugin and most people do, but sometimes you need that little bit more to do that special setup uh, and, and take care of some requirements um, um, on, on the local side. Uh, sometimes also it's because your module only should and uh, run on the local machine. A lot of uh, cloud provisioning happens only on the local side or, or things of that nature. So um, just to make you aware of action plugins, I know I'm, I'm breezing over this really quickly. 
uh, uh, for lack of time here, uh, just be aware that modules are work very closely with action plugins, and sometimes you need to develop an action plugin to um, get that to work properly. All right, so with that, uh, I'm going to uh, take a few questions. Uh, we're probably gonna run a little bit over the one hour mark. Um, so uh, thanks for listening and um, yeah, we'll listen to your questions. Oh, one, one other quick thing here. Uh, you know, I, I went over a lot, through a lot of information at you and only really scratched the surface. If you wanna learn more about developing, particularly Ansible modules, but Ansible in general, really recommend checking out our developer's guide uh, at this URL here. I'm going to leave that up during the, uh, the questions. So, um, Andreas, do we have any questions? Yeah, we've got a couple. So the first one we have is, uh, how about, um, there's some people here using PowerShell. So are there any like best practices around writing, uh, should we write modules against PowerShell instead of calling PowerShell scripts, um, located in the files, of the roles, or what, or any, any kind of quick, I know that that's probably a long one yeah. question and answer there, uh, but um. yeah, my my recommendation is is to write write the modules because the in in in, in PowerShell versus um, just executing PowerShells themselves, you're 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 losing out on a, a number of the functions of Ansible and the integration with Ansible itself that you would have to either recreate yourself or your end users wouldn't benefit from. So I would I would recommend creating the modules. Um, in, in PowerShell around that. I'm not a Windows person myself, but there are numerous examples of Windows modules being written in, um, in PowerShell 3 inside of the Ansible core. Uh, if, if you go up to um, GitHub and Ansible Ansible and look under the modules, you'll see uh, the Windows ones there. And as um, Yeah, I think you can also, way. I think you can also, um, there's also a Windows um, community as well, uh, sub community. Yeah. So I would I would recommend um, if you're a Windows developer, for, um, you can go to github.com slash ansible slash community and you can find the, the Ansible for Windows working group. I think that would be a great starting point uh, as well. Yes, so. that, that's an excellent point, Andrews. Thank you. Yeah, and some of our, our, our engineers that are developing our Windows integration are active participants in that working group. So um, you can't get a better expert opinion than, than those folks. Cool. All right, next question is, um, so are playbooks mostly declarative while modules are imperative? Um, yeah, I guess, yes, you could say that uh, um, in that the, 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 the module, I'm, I'm assuming they mean the module code, mm -hmm. the implementation itself. Correct. Uh, yes. Uh, those those are more imperative. That's where you're writing essentially a mini program to run on the I think we lost audio. Um, Tim, are you still there? Oh, I'm not sure if he made it or not. Um, I think the um, not sure right, I'm here. Sorry, did I, my back. The network just uh, um, there. You go. Froze yeah. here on my yeah, end. I hear, I hear you. Yeah, I think I think sorry, what I was going to say. Sorry, I was, sorry. It's fine. Yeah, just, I was going to say uh, that 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 modules are imperative. Mo modules don't don't have any idea of what state. Um, there's no yeah. state as part of as part of you know this, this the statefulness is is part of. Um, you know, uh, typically the, 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 the Python code that you're writing. Yeah. Right. So it definitely is imperative. And what I was starting to say before the network got wonky here at the office um, is that it, it you know, Ansible, Ansible uh, packages up these, these modules, these programs, sends them across to the remote and then executes them on that side. That's the most typical um, pattern that's used. I know it's different for networking where you can't run Python on a device, but that's, that's the the initial pattern. That's how Ansible works agentlessly. It's through the packaging of these modules code, shipping them over to the remote, executing them, and then pulling back the results. So uh, it, it it's very imperative because it's just like you any other Python piece you know piece of Python software. 
Now, and speaking of Python, is this are most modules written in Python? Is that a requirement? And if so, what version of Python? Um, yes. So, uh, in, in terms of getting it into core and making the most use of what Ansible gives you, it's Python or PowerShell three. PowerShell three being for Windows um, in, in implementation. There are ways to extend Ansible using other programming languages. In a previous life before I joined Ansible, I actually wrote one in Bash. There's a long story why I had to do that. Uh, but it is not anything that we would accept into the Ansible uh, project itself. So if you're writing it for yourself, have at it. But if you want to contribute it back to the uh, Ansible community, it will have to be in um, Python 3. I should uh, to start answering the other half of your question, um, or PowerShell 3. Uh, we do still support Python 2.7, but that's going to be going away soon because Python and the, the versions of Linux that we support are end of life and are only shipping Python 3. We really recommend you, you, you write in, 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 in Python 3. There's a number of compatibility libraries and utilities out there for writing code for both, but I would definitely focus on Python 3 at this point. Sounds good. Um, we have some questions here, but I think we're over time. We're going to do one more here. The um, yeah. question is, can you store roles in a private Ansible Galaxy, or can you theoretically store and share playbooks there also? So I guess there's more of a um, storage piece, I think, could be a little confusing from, from yeah. Galaxy. And there's two, a couple things going on there. Maybe you can explain um, maybe in a high-level overview really quick of, of how yeah. Galaxy can be part of this effort. Yeah, so, so uh, we, we have a lot going on with Galaxy itself uh, that, that, that we're working on. But currently today, you, would use the, uh, you can use the Ansible CLI and pull directly from a Git or Subversion repository. As long as your, your repo has been set up one role per uh, repo, you can pull private uh, uh, roles in from different sources outside of Galaxy itself. Uh, Galaxy is right now it, it, itself going through uh, a lot of development, a lot of changes. Uh, the code is available. We are Red Hat, so everything is open source. Uh, the the uh, I do know that that we're lagging on the ability to install uh, Galaxy uh, easily. The the documentation isn't there for it. Um, so uh, sort of a you know a caveat to that in trying to deploy Galaxy in your uh, local system uh, or, or or your local environment. Sorry. And then the I'm um, oh, sorry. What was the third part of that question? Uh, uh, is, so is it actually, so is it, um, is it the storage piece? So uh, is it, can you do private, other private ability to have private galaxies? Oh, uh, okay, so that, that was sort of what I, the, yeah. the way I was answering. Uh, at the time, in terms of uh, uh, something that, that we Ansible support, the answer is uh, no. Uh, but like I said, the code is available. Uh, that we use to run galaxy.ansible.com is something that we're looking at and considering, uh, but at this time don't have any um, specific plans. The way I recommend you go about doing that is uh, storing your roles into whatever uh, version control system you use. I think most people these days are using Git um, and then using the Ansible Galaxy command line tool to pull those straight from uh, your version control system uh, into your projects. Okay, awesome. I know we're way over time here, so yeah, sorry um, about that. Wrap up and and, and want to say thank you for everyone who's joined. We are going to have this posted online to the Ansible.com webinar section. Um, we will have more of these. If you think this was great, we'll have more of these. Um, shoot us a note. Uh, and join the community to get to get started. Uh, thank you all very much for joining. Thank you, Tim, for your time in, in presenting, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Pat.